Um, my name is Anne Chappell. I'm the USB Brunel coordinator, so that's my, been my role as one of the seven partners in the program. Um, I'm based in the education department there, and that's really been really, really very interesting. It's particularly interesting for us in relation to what we're doing now in the panel, because the panelists that I'm about to introduce you to come from a range of different places and spaces, and that's been one of the really very exciting things about the project, is people coming together who come from different research backgrounds and different spaces for thinking, and the kinds of dialogue that that's generated for us has been really, really valuable in terms of our work. Um, so what I wanted to do was to very briefly introduce each of our uh, panelists, and they are each going to speak for five minutes. So we've changed the structure in terms of the experience we've had first thing, because what we'd like to do in this panel is generate more discussion. And we have some questions and some points for provocation that we will throw over um, as we get to the end of the panel in order to generate much discussion before we go into lunch, where we'll then have a lengthy break to, be able to talk about all the kinds of questions and comments and thoughts and views that we've had over the course of the morning. Um, so thank you in advance for your participation in this session. We much appreciate it. Um, so four colleagues to introduce to you. I'm going to introduce them briefly, and then each of them will, will um, speak to you around the, the, the topic that they're focusing on. So colleagues listed behind me. So um, Joanna, uh, Juana Gallieco, forgive me, <laughs> <laughs> pronunciation, not all right, um, who is um, uh, based at the um, university, the Autonomous University in Barcelona. And the kind of work that one has been involved in is around women and power, um, vulnerability, accountability. So she's going to have some really interesting things, as the rest of the panel are, to say about the kind of work that, that we're thinking about today. Um, Mara Martini is a psychologist and works in work and organisation, um, but is interested in things around gender, gender stereotyping and violence. Um, but also stress and well-being in organisational context, which of course is very interesting in those other questions that relate to, to the material around sexual violence. Um, we have Antigone Liberaki, um, who is based at Pantheon University in Greece, um, and her work is around um, economics and policy and feminist economics, um, but also has a, an involvement and interest in politics, if you like to say, an MP. Um, and then finally, Alison Phipps, who is at Sussex and works in gender studies, which those of you from the UK will know well, um, has done a lot of work around the work going on in universities with student unions and organisations, um, and has been most recently involved in this project, but also some work around changing university cultures, which given the previous panel, is obviously really critical in the kind of work that this relates to. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everybody today. Um, our, our, um, our question is around changing campus cultures to create more open and supportive spaces for survivors. Um, and we've got a range of different ideas to, to share. Um, they're up there behind me. Um, but thinking about protocols, thinking about rates, Thinking about the um, public and the political rather than the personal and the private, and then also the challenges around change in neoliberal universities. Um, so you can see we've got a lot to pack into 20 minutes. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Juan. I come from uh, Barcelona, uh, the University of Autonomous of Barcelona is the second biggest university in, in Barcelona, the full public university. Uh, it's a very big university with uh, almost 40,000 40, students and 3,000 teachers. Um, it's a university, I think, that it's one of the, of the most interested in, in, in violence, sexual violence. And um, I, yeah, yes. Um, I have been working in this uh, subject uh, for a long time, 
uh, but almost um, related to communication. I am a teacher from gender and communication. But uh, last year, in November, uh, just uh, this month, I was appointed like uh, as a new director of the observatory of the university. So um, this last year, I have been working in, uh, with the protocol uh, against gender-based violence at our university. Um, we have the second, the second, yeah. Uh, the observatory, as uh, Barbara and um, Isaskun said before, uh, is something like uh, the unit, quality unity in the university. Uh, we have a framework, a legal framework in Spain. Uh, I think it's quite well. I think it's quite good. We have three main laws for all the Spain, uh, the state of Spain. Uh, the first law is uh, 2004. Um, the name, the goal, uh, the name exactly is um, uh, the, the general law against gender-based violence. Uh, violence. So this is the first uh, main uh, framework that we have to do, in, in, we have to, to, to consider it. The second law is uh, 2007, equality law between men and women, and this is a, 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 a general law uh, in Spain. And we have in Catalonia so two uh, equality catalan law between men and women from uh, 2015. So I think. Uh, honestly, that uh, our framework, the legal framework, is quite good. But not uh, always the, the law is accomplished. So the, I think the legal, work, uh, the, legal, the, legal, the legal framework is better than the reality. Um, in, the, in our university, in the Autonomous University of Barcelona, we have, uh, uh, we have third, uh, four, well, <coughs> Almost four. We have in the third action plan for equality between men and women uh, started in 2013 and finished this year. One of the most important uh, goals of this uh, third action plan is uh, a, a fight against uh, gender based uh, violence. <laughs> Or to me. So, um, oh, five minutes, yes. So, um, well, we have this protocol. Uh, this protocol can be activated by students, teachers, and administrative staff. Uh, the process, the process takes a month. Uh, this uh, protocol, this protocol, this is a protocol closure in English. Uh, it, it solves uh, almost all for for Erasmus students and for foreigners students that came from to Barcelona to study. But this is a protocol we want to, to publish to, 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 to give publicity to this uh, protocol. And uh, all the students, uh, teachers, and the staff can activate it if they, if they are in this situation. Uh, the commission uh, is formed from four people one person from the legal service, another person from the psychology service, another person from the staff preventive service, and one person from the observatory that uh, almost the time we are the person of the observatory. Uh, we have, uh, we, we try to do a lot of campaigns uh, against violence, and this, this uh, that I am showing are one but, but some of the most important campaigns that we have done. Uh, I should uh, explain more and deeply uh, all the process, but uh, I have just uh, one minute. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's very difficult, it's very difficult to explain in one minute all uh, what uh, we have done. But this is uh, this is our, our main campaign. For example, um, this is our the promotion, the publicity, the advertising of our last uh, campaign. Um, uh, all, all the year or every year we have at least one campaign against uh, gender-based violence uh, and I uh, think people at the university is knowing now more our, our, our protocol. Um, well, I would like to explain uh, um, how the protocol uh, has uh, functioned until this month. I don't have uh, time anymore. So this is all. Thank you for that. 
Hi to everyone. I'm Mara Martini. From, I am a research fellow from the University of Turin. And uh, I can, uh, can I have my... Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, my presentation, my very short presentation, is about uh, um, the diffusion of rape meets a first representation about uh, gender violence. Uh, in uh, the two universities between uh, um, among the uh, uh, students of the university and of the polytechnic of Turin. Uh, in uh, Italian cultural, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, false representation of uh, rapists. Right. Uh, so um, we was uh, interested to understand how, how much there are uh, spread in the specific context of the uh, university. So we send uh, to all the students of our, our uh, university a link uh, uh, to fill in a questionnaire. Uh, for uh, 4,027 students uh, fill in the online questionnaire. And uh, uh, we asked them uh, uh, several things, but uh, among the others, uh, uh, two uh, groups of uh, questions, two uh, batteries, two scales, were uh, about. Uh, uh, can you change this? Uh, are about uh, rape uh, meets, uh, and that uh, are false representation justifying uh, gender violence or uh, uh, minimizing uh, the uh, ser seriousness of, um, of rapism. And uh, another scale was about uh, bystander efficacy, uh, bystander efficacy, that is uh, the intention to intervene, to uh, contrast uh, uh, violence uh, when it is uh, happening. Um, in, the, in this, case, in this um, slide, uh, you can see uh, students' answer. Uh, their agreement with each of these uh, 22 uh, items states uh, that they express a false representation. Uh, they are uh, grouped in the four uh, um, big myths that are uh, she asked for it. He did, didn't mean to, uh, it wasn't uh, really rape and she lied. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, students' agreement uh, are not, is not so high, but uh, you can't avoid to note uh, that uh, uh, about 20% uh, uh, or more, that is uh, one student uh, in uh, five or in four students, um, say, uh, are agree with um, Satan as uh, when uh, girls are raped, uh, it's often because of the way they say no as a volunteer. Or uh, when girls are raped, it is usually because uh, of the strong desire for sex. And uh, it is quite uh, worrying. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, we can see that uh, uh, about uh, their intention to intervene, uh, answers are, uh, show a quite high um, values because uh, uh, in, uh, on a scale between uh, 0 and 10, uh, all the uh, values are quite high. But uh, we can see that uh, uh, towards uh, uh, more subtle uh, uh, forms of violence as uh, uh, a joke about the woman's body uh, is uh, uh, lower. Um, the intention to implement is uh, uh, clearly lower. Uh, so, um, very interesting uh, in my opinion is uh, the next analysis uh, that uh, show uh, as uh, uh, there is a strong correlation with uh, the two uh, means uh, that there is a meaning, uh, very meaningful uh, and strong correlation between the intention to intervene, to contrast uh, any form of uh, violence and uh, the disagreement uh, with uh, each of these needs. But uh, uh, we, we can say uh, if uh, we are able to 
change um, more and more uh, this uh, beginning, probably more uh, spread can be also the intention to intervene to contrast, uh, even if uh, we are not directly involved uh, as the bystander uh, bystander studies uh, uh, express uh, and uh, we can see it uh, in, a, in a group of studies in the uh, USA by Ibania, uh, for example. Uh, okay. uh, so, uh, <coughs> we think that uh, uh, it's very important to try to invest uh, on uh, primary prevention, changing of uh, cultural uh, beliefs uh, before uh, the violence uh, is uh, happened. sharing some uh, views with you. I'll try to be provocative as I was asked. So I'll start straight away saying that I come from a society and an academic milieu where there exist lots of narratives on general and societal issues. Um, such narratives are used liberally, happily and without restraint for many people. And uh, to give you a few examples, the anti-globalization narrative, the anti-neoliberal, liberalism narrative, the anti-EU narrative, the um, anti-crisis narrative, um, anti-police narrative as well. Big issues, political, public. What we lack, however, is an understanding of uh, more personal and private experiences and the, the capacity to link ideas and issues of liberty and liberation to everyday lived experience. And this is why in Greece we have all sorts of um, institutional um, regulations for all sorts of things, but we don't have anything, as Alexandra Zabu remarked earlier, about how to deal with sexual violence university level. So, when the issue of sexual violence is raised uh, in the university, uh, one gets typically two reactions, very characteristic of the Greek situation, both of them. The first is, you do not have the right to interfere and to police the way I conduct my private affairs. I am... Um, uh, I'm rebelling uh, against uh, authorities. You cannot tell me how I'm going to flirt with whoever I want to, whenever I want to. So this is one issue that somehow is used to co mask and conceal the most traditional and horrible and reactionary attitudes. The second kind of uh, reaction you get is the Chinese farming type of fallacy. Oh yes, of course, sexual violence is a horrible thing, but you know, compared to what's happening in Pakistan, for instance, or in places of Africa, or in the moon, um, <laughs> the size of the problem we are facing here is not that important, whereas we are pressed with more important issues like uh, combating the crisis, um, fighting against the bad guys and in general. So we end up doing nothing because the scale of the problem is not um, evaluated as being enough to attract uh, collective action. So let me, uh, thank you, uh, let me um, also instead of criticizing everybody else, uh, include also a self-critical note that uh, uh, the tradition of the, the, the old feminist movement, uh, old in the sense of um, uh, ages in which I uh, also belong, where you, we used to be uh, very much focused on social uh, issues 
uh, gender seen as the social consequences of and never uh, the array of choice that people could have in their sexualities. And my feeling is that uh, um, uh, we feminists in Greece are partly to be criticized for the total lack of interest and focus on personal matters. So in the end, I wonder, can we erase uh, gender-based violence issues without dealing with um, freedom to choose sexual identities? Thank you. I don't have a PowerPoint either, I'm low tech. But I do feel like I've broken into song. Okay. Does anybody mind if I do a couple of Aerosmith covers? Oh, <laughs> so, um, no. <laughs> Show my age, don't mind. Or <laughs> well, the younger ones are done. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much, and um, thanks very much to all the other speakers for highlighting lots of different issues which speak to the phenomenon of culture in our universities. Um, I've been working on sexual harassment and violence in UK universities for about 12 years now, and I've done a lot of thinking about culture. Um, and actually, I think in the UK, we always have the opposite problem in that our discourse can sometimes be too focused on the personal and not enough on the bigger picture, and Ruth kind of highlighted that in her um, talk as well. So I started out researching lab culture among students, um, and I think the other speakers have highlighted similar issues around gendered cultures, which express themselves through things like rape myths, and make it very difficult to implement progressive policies and procedures. Um, and more recently, I've been looking at how sexual harassment and violence are shaped by the cultures of the neoliberal university, although we do also have a similar phenomenon in this country by which the critique of neoliberalism is also used as an excuse for bad behavior. Um, but I have looked at how the structures and cultures of neoliberalism um, and the market rationalities of neoliberalism neoliberalism situate issues of sexual harassment and violence between, within what I call reckonings, in which the institutional impact of disclosure is projected and turned up, and in which the personal can often be locked. So this produces what I've called institutional airbrushing, in which a, um, a, an emphasis on the appearance of the university takes precedence over staff and student welfare. So institutional airbrushing takes two main forms. Either issues are denied, concealed, minimized, um, and settled quietly, or when it's not possible to do that, sometimes after the media has been involved, the perpetrator themselves is airbrushed from the institution and it's made to appear as if they were never there. And the key point for me in both of these things is that the impact of disclosures on the future value of the institution is more troubling than the issues of harassment and violence that they reveal. And I think all of the speakers on this panel have reminded us that the institution is not a neutral space. So that's a key premise for my work in this area. Universities are patriarchal, they're also racist, classist and other things as well. So they can't be looked to unproblematically to undo the harms of those systems. And there are also intersectional questions for me around who is more likely to be deemed worthy of protection when the institution does intervene, and also who is more likely to be treated harshly by punitive policies and processes. Um, so for me, trying to implement progressive policies in a problematic culture, e.g. one in which redness is pervasive, or one which is institutionally racist, is like trying to cut wood against the grain or trying to get water to flow upstream. And policy change can also be performed for market benefit in cultures dominated by the market, which has problematic results. So a recent report by Warwick Academics on Athena Swan, which is our UK gender equality accreditation exercise, revealed that bad practice is often covered up rather than dealt with for the purpose of applications. And furthermore, as Sarah Ahmed has argued in relation to race equality schemes, when accreditations like this are awarded, they become a means to deny the existence of a problem or to claim that the problem has been solved. So in other words, equality initiatives themselves can become tools for institutional airbrushing within dysfunctional cultures. 
And I'm not necessarily saying that institutions can't change. I've done a lot of work on changing institutional cultures, which we can talk about in the questions. Um, but I think that institutional cultural change is a long process, which requires commitment, deep thinking, and also the capacity to be vulnerable on the part of individuals and the institution itself. So for many student and staff survivors, the university is what perpetrates the second rape that exacerbates their trauma. And the perpetration of this second rape is, the institution, is, is a function of the institutional refusal to be vulnerable, to admit weakness, to tackle problems head on. So similar to the first rape, which is often about the perpetrator's desire for power and control, in the second rape, the institution denies the problem and closes ranks to protect itself from market risk. So my question to you and for this panel for the discussion in a minute is how can we work to change institutional cultures in marketised higher education? Thank you. Thanks. So thank, thanks to the panellists at this point, um, but I have encouraged the panellists to you know, join in the discussion with each other as much as in response to questions. The four provocations um, are up behind us. Um, so you know, we're encouraging you to think very particularly in relation to these, um, these provocations, but also to ask questions that relate directly to them. Um, and you know, they, are, they, they arise from the, the presentations that the panelists have given, which I'm sure you'd agree, we've managed to pack an awful lot there into four lots of five minutes, so my thanks very much to colleagues for doing that. Um, but given there's a lot to think about, we have about 20 to 25 minutes before lunch to be able to discuss some of these ideas. So, with a roving mic, which is very good news, thank you, Jokin will um, arise at your side should you wish to, to, to say anything. I've just opened the floor to any questions that colleagues might have. <coughs> We need some roller skates or something, don't we, for this job? <laughs> changed significantly over recent times and universities are, very, are much more open to activities being undertaken in this area. But there's a group in the UK called the 1752 group whose work is around staff student sexual violence and inappropriate sexual behaviour and their report will be published soon. Um, and Rose's uh, question is, you know, how, how can we encourage universities to keep the dialogue open rather than shutting down when a report like that comes out, which will indicate that there are some difficulties and problems in the um, institution. Is that, yeah? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really useful question, and I'm not sure I have all the answers. And it seems to be a bit of a cyclical process, so you can't always predict what institutions are going to do. But I think that um, we do need to work deeply and constructively with institutions. And I do think we need to be careful about how we use the media in relation to, I mean, certainly in this country where the issue has moved on um, quite a bit, because the media are a law unto themselves. Um, and sometimes their interventions can be quite unhelpful. For instance, they seem to labor under the misapprehension that more reports means more assaults, um, whereas more reports might just mean that you have better systems in place for capturing what's going on. Um, so I think the more we can work with our institutions and almost perform a, a, a reassurance type role about these types of things, the better. Um, I 
not everybody in the room will agree with this, but I am deeply opposed to naming and shaming of perpetrators. Um, I don't think it's helpful. I think it creates a culture of fear, and I don't think fear gets institutions or, or individuals to change in particularly helpful ways. Um, so I think we need to think about our own integrity as well when we're engaging with these issues. Um, and also the cultural work that we need to do in institutions will hopefully help them to stop hiding under the bed when things do emerge, um, because that response is, is not working anymore. And I'm not sure whether it will work as and when the next scandal breaks because of the power of social media. It seems as though this juggernaut is not going to be stopped by universities dying. Does that kind of answer your question? I don't have all the answers. Um, I would like to say that uh, I think that in Spain there are and now there are there is much more awareness about this problem about this um, sexual violence. Um, you know, I think I think um, people is very worried. It's worried because in Spain we have at least 50 women uh, murdered every year. And uh, at the street, in the people in general, are much more uh, interested by this problem. Uh, a few months ago, there was an agreement of state, a state an agreement uh, without to fight, without uh, violence, uh, sexual violence. It's not perfect, of course. Uh, we need uh, much more uh, commitment, uh, institutional commitment of the government. Um, but in the, I think there are um, a very lively movement in the social social network uh, between women, young women, and a uh, group of women. Also, there are a, a reaction again, also uh, that, that we can see in the social network. But um, I think in the academy, at least uh, in my university. In, for example, students are now debating a code of ethics for their association against uh, gender-based violence and harassment. So, I think it's, it's a good moment to, to think about and to, to worry about this problem. We have uh, uh, many problems uh, already, but uh, I think it's a good moment to fight and uh, many people are worried about this. So I suppose it's really interesting there, isn't it, in terms of these pressures that come from different places and the impact that will have on then the way universities will have to respond. Rose, thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, I, look, yeah. um, I just want to relate to that. I'm Emma Chapman from the 1752 Group. Um, we're very keen on keeping this as a self-propelling movement so we don't just stop by asking universities to accept there's a problem but actually by embedding the accountability within the entire university framework so as soon as possible tying it to for example funding agencies like the medical council requiring um, uh, a female swan silver to go for it and then well first of all we've got to have grass and the women and the swan for example but actually tying it into uh, funding accreditation for physics programs we're looking at the minute with the institute of physics to actually say well if you can't guarantee the safety of your students why uh, should we be accrediting you to do um, so it's very much about making ourselves redundant uh, and making sure the universities keep the spotlight on themselves. One of the other branches we're looking at is a room of confidentiality around the processes. So it's not on the students to have to go to BuzzFeed. It's not on whistleblowers to risk their careers. It's on the universities to not publicise but accept the outcome of a disciplinary process, make that transparent and therefore the spotlight should stay. Thank you. I think what's really important to share there for um, European uh, colleagues is that because the way in which research funding is organised in the UK and because of the research excellence framework um, activities and the importance of that in the university's status and standing and in people's individual academic careers, tying things to those codes of conduct that are associated to research in this context is a really powerful thing to do. Um, because research funding is very important and it's high stakes for universities. So thank you. And do you want to comment on that? Can I ask it? I think it's that one. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to respond to your questions, to the question you raised before. 
saying how can we um, uh, deal with the uh, issues of um, uh, the sexual violence in universities at the time when universities are closing ranks and are trying to protect themselves in order to have a good day in, in, uh, in the market. This reminds me exactly what happens with families. Families are closing, closing ranks all the time. They are protecting both victims and perpetrators. Uh, they are um, uh, cooperating here to push the problem. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's a big problem, but on top. So why don't we use some of the examples of changing families in order to, you know, use it in the university of law? Um, I'm Isabella Santa Maria. I work for London School of Economics. I just have a question, not related to a certain institution, but related to a culture of higher education here in the United Kingdom. Although there is a lot of talk and there is legislation and there are policies in place and waiting for uh, sexual harassment or rape and so on, um, there is also a culture in higher education of protecting certain individuals in certain positions in higher education and not others. So when you report something, if that individual is bringing 30 million pounds mm. research funding to the institution, it will be hash hash and nobody will talk about it. However, if it was a woman who was accused of sexual harassment or somebody who was not bringing that much research money into the institution, it would be a witch hunt and that person will be made as a, oh look, we are doing what we need to do and this is an example of what we've done. Is there any movement or this research could um, uh, do something about institutions needing to look at every individual and not protect certain people and not others? It's quite interesting in relation to the, the talk that Juana gave there because she was talking about the difference between the legal framework, which we could also say policy framework, and reality, which is the point that you're making. <coughs> well, I would like to say that, uh, that I said before. We have a good law. If a law applied uh, in the good sense, I think it would be better to fight, to fight against a sexual violence. But, as she said, I think that the culture won't change if we can change the media. Video clips, movies, uh, advertising, this, all this uh, imaginary moves to, to sexual, sexual activity. So, how can we fight without, uh, against sexual violence if we have all the imaginary in the communication uh, that uh, shows the uh, sexual sexualization of women? This is very difficult to do. I don't know how to do it. And it's also connected to Alison's points about the neoliberal university and the point earlier on about research. So this one. Um, yeah, I mean, some people are reckoned up differently to others, aren't they? You know, some people are worth more than others within the internal economy of the university. Um, and I don't know what the answer is to that, apart from to say that the policy should apply to everyone. But that's, it's, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, and one of the questions that we ask in our project, um, Changing University Cultures, is how can we stop the universities from just defaulting to market-based calculations when there's a disclosure of sexual harassment and violence. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, because some people are worth more to the institution, aren't they? Um, they should be, but they are. Yeah. Anybody else? Any ideas? <laughs> Um, yes, just to bring in, in um, you know, the cultural difference perspective, but um, for instance in Greece it might not be, the, let's say the purchase of an individual in, in their institution might not be linked to their market value, uh, but it might be linked to their political uh, value. So, um, you know, it, even I think naming that, that this is not a, it's not an absolute value. So 
since different cultures and different institutions uh, attribute value to different kinds of uh, social um, uh, goods, let's say, or resources, I think we can start by, from that point, to start deconstructing that value. So I think there needs to be a kind of, let's say, discourse uh, that deconstructs the value system in, in, in you know, different institutions. Yeah, I think that's right. And some of the other work we've done with the universities is on their actual values. So to say, what do you value? And maybe if we can raise the profile of some of these other values, these civic values rather than economic ones, then the balance would start to look slightly different. Because if actually part of the draw of the university is that we have strong community values, we treat each other in a certain way, we educate young people to become good citizens in these ways, then suddenly the professor who was bringing in £30 million pounds but not behaving according to those values starts to look slightly different. Um, so I think that there might be something there. Because it's all very well to say they shouldn't be worth more, let's get rid of them, but I don't think that that's a particularly effective approach. I think the introduction of the teaching excellence framework is going to be really, really interesting mm -hmm. because that's going to change the way that universities have to talk about themselves. The metrics are still pre metrics, but we'll be, we'll be measured on the student experience. And of course, this relates in part to student experience. And it has. And well. that, yeah, well, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm fully aware that um, when universities need to um, make the calculation of the pros and cons and sell their market to the their, their product to the market, they try to hide the the unattractive aspects. However, the, the alternative, not having anybody evaluating you and um, having a captive um, uh, student population that just pass some uh, impersonal exams and they end up at your uh, classroom without ever choosing you or considering you or ever evaluating you, this could be even worse. Yes. No? Okay. So we have two, time for two more. Colleague here and then the colleague over here. Sorry. Yeah, I want to answer Isabel's uh, question around um, what can we do around people who carry so much research funding in the universities that they're worried about. Um, you know, pressing on and investigating those people and actually I think it's about the, the grant funders as well and I think they, they should have strong um, narratives on this and strong procedures for investigating the people who they're giving money to um, and that should all be connected and I also think that people like Hefke should be stepping in where if a university has been brave enough to dismiss someone who carries a huge research grant how are Hefke supporting that university to have taken that first step? So again, just for European partners, HEFKI is the Higher Education Funding Council. So the, the, they have a, a, a significant <coughs> remit in the work of the university. And of course now we have an office for students, um, which again, in relation to the tech and the kind of changing climate, is going to be really interesting, I think. Um, so one final question, comment, and we are. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, I'm quite curious about the experience of the European uh, universities and non-UK universities in terms of to what extent why the media influence uh, the response of the universities when there is a sexual violence, sexual harassment incident within university premises. In my experience in the UK, media very much shape and sometimes dictates the university's response, especially when the particular incident in question is very much publicized on the political consequences. Very difficult to uh, to understand uh, who influences uh, who, because uh, it's a uh, bit of a dangerous circle because. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, medium, uh, media influences uh, uh, um, common opinion, and uh, it is uh, in this way it's, uh, shaped it. But uh, um, uh, I, uh, I try to uh, to tell uh, very quickly uh, something that happens uh, inside this project because uh, we uh, diffused uh, in our um, final uh, moment. Uh, 
the, the, of the training, uh, it was a plenary session. Uh, we um, fused the uh, results of our uh, student lesson, and uh, the day after, the uh, newspaper uh, wrote uh, something very strange, very different from uh, the things we said during the, the session. Uh, so uh, it is uh, very difficult uh, to create uh, a language uh, that uh, to communicate the, the things uh, in, in a way that is uh, um, safe, I think. But uh, I think also that if uh, we are uh, um, strong in uh, um, naming uh, things, uh, naming uh, violence uh, as a violence, not as a joke, uh, or as a not important things, I think uh, we can uh, lead the change of things. Just come in uh, with the, on the issue of media. I think that media can be blamed from now till eternity. There are many grounds to do so. I don't think it's a very useful way of going about um, I think that, uh, of course, uh, criticizing uh, media images uh, can be a good uh, advocacy point. But in reality, uh, we um, uh, need to uh, produce images and uh, narratives that are strong enough and attractive enough to move along on their own and not wait for the media to do our work first. So in a sense, um, media in Greece, for instance, um, reserve their um, interest in, of the private life of individuals only in the uh, political sphere, but they somehow live alone, um, normal people, the only case of sexual violence that really hit the, the first uh, pages of uh, uh, the, the newspaper was a couple of years ago about uh, a young male gay student who uh, was from Crete and I'm saying this because it's a very macho culture uh, of whoever of you are uh, acquainted with uh, this particular island. And he was studying um, elsewhere, away from home in Yanana equally aggressive um, uh, macho culture. And he got, he was so uh, uh, relentlessly bullied that in the end he took his own life. Mm. And when there is a, a dead body, uh, suddenly it becomes an issue. Nobody knows exactly how to deal with this issue. Uh, and then it dies out in a few days. I think that this pretty much sums up uh, what happens when you don't have a narrative linking personal freedom, personal life, uh, personal identities with broader narratives of values. Thank you. So, uh, if we return to our kind of question, which we were, were set for this panel, which was around changing campus cultures, in the end, we come back to context and culture in a much broader sense, which is, resonates with the panel this morning, and I'm sure will resonate with some more conversations later on. The place of the personal versus the public, and the private, and the political, and the way in which those interact. And of course, when we talk about politics, and political, and policy, we're talking about many, many different levels. And there are clearly some really, really interesting and very, very important things that we have to think about in all of our contexts as contexts change and policy decisions are made and the ways in which we can respond to those. Um, so can I thank you all very much for your comments, questions, thoughts, considerations. I hope people are tweeting furiously because I'm desperate to kind of read the things that people have been thinking while we've been talking. Um, I'd like to thank very much the, the, the members of the panel. Um, I feel very privileged to have been asked to chair this because it's been really fascinating. So thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you.